What we can say is that the, 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 the mediumship and spiritualist movement seemed to start in, I think it was in upstate New York, in sometime maybe the 1780s, 1800s, 1820s, I'm not sure, with two sisters who um, experienced these strange knockings and rappings in the house. And this eventually was construed to be a communication from the spirit world, and it attracted, as far as I know, uh, a vast amount of interest from many people, many of who were influential and um, notable people at the time, and many people journeyed to see these sisters. They may have been called the Fox Sisters. And from this, the whole um, spiritualist movement developed, and it became, by the time we got to the Victorian age, a vast craze, both in Britain and America. Um, so that more or less, you know, we're talking about two taps for yes, one tap for no. I would imagine it'd be something like that, you know, knockings and rappings. Uh, and this became a huge craze, and of course there were many, many uh, fake mediums and con artists and all sorts of yeah. uh, incredible uh, ways of getting money out of people and fooling them took place. Uh, one of the big ones that they would, would be that they would have the medium in some kind of thing called the cabinet, which may be a cloth box or something like that and there would be a person hiding behind the cabinet so they would dim the lights and this person who would be dressed in a sort of body hugging uh, uh, clothing would sort of creep out and pretend to be a spirit and all sorts of lunacy was going on. There's loads of fake pictures of ectoplasm and it's just a, a table napkin coming out of somebody's ear. Yeah, praying, that's right, yeah, pray, praying, on, praying on the gullible. And what is the basis of all this? The basis of all this is the, first of all, the fear of death, and secondly, the worry that people have about what will happen to me when I die. Because apart from the ministrations of religion, for example, the idea of the, uh, the Catholic religion that if, you're, if you've been good, you will, uh, you'll go to heaven, and if you've been bad, you'll go to purgatory, and if you're really bad, you'll go to hell. Um, not a great deal of information is offered in Western religion anyway, about what happens. It's a kind of blank page, so consequently there is fear, a vast fear surrounding death. Um, on top of that, there is also a vast degree of prohibition on mediumistic communication by orthodox religion. So people are actively discouraged, not entirely for bad reasons, or negative reasons, from engaging in this type of communication. But most of the, the mediumistic work or medium work that's done in, in Britain today is by mediums who are doing or attempting to establish contact with dead relatives. You know, people are grieving, they're extremely upset, and they are looking for confirmation of survival of death. And, and there's a sort of renaissance every time there's a war, apparently. More and more people are searching for contact with people who've been killed in wars. Well, no, no doubt. Do you, do you want me to re recount the Churchill case at all? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's, it, it's known, I think the BBC in fact did a documentary on this, that um, there was a very good medium working in Britain during the Second World War, a lady who, um, was a, because mediumship was illegal under the, I think it was the Witchcraft Act or something like that, uh, was working of course in private, and people were coming to see her, and she revealed to an inquirer that the ship that her son or relative had been on had in fact been sunk and that her, her relative had perished. Now, the authorities um, uh, found out she'd revealed this information, which in fact at that point was, was still embargoed. Because we were at war. Because we were at war and because they didn't want to, to either give the, en the enemy an advantage or whatever. And they took her to trial uh, for treason or whatever you want to call it. Uh, the hapless woman, of course, was only doing a job as a medium. And apparently Churchill himself heard of the case and had it stopped because he said, we're in the middle of a war, what are we wasting time and effort for on this type of uh, stuff? This is completely um, irrelevant. And the, the, the Witchcraft Act, I think, was repealed in 1951, which is the year that Churchill, in fact, uh, came back to power with the, uh, the, the Conservative Party. So what we may presume or derived from that about Churchill's involvement or interest in, in such things, I don't know, but he certainly was not clearly un, un, unsympathetic. Yeah, uh, you know, wasting resources. To yeah, or he may have just considered it to be so trivial as just not 
to be worth bothering. We don't know. Or maybe we, we could know if we researched it. But since 1951, it, to act as a medium uh, is now, it has been legal. And of course, there, is, there are a vast amount of mediums working in, in Britain. Um, well, there's an entire spiritualist church. Uh... Yes, there is a spiritualist church and there's a kind of college of spiritualism at Stansted near London. Uh, which has been established for many, many years, and people can go to Stansted, learn mediumship, and, and so on and so forth. And this is very important. I, I, I know mediums who've been to Stansted, and they apparently have fantastic sessions and materializations and all this kind of stuff. So this is, and then of course we've had the, this, the SPR, Society for Psychical Research, which has existed since well, 1880, time. something yeah, like that, 1890. Yeah with voluminous records. Yeah. So it's been taken seriously, but it's not taken very seriously by mainstream science. Well, it's not taken seriously by the media, because they don't like sort of covering anything that they, that they can't explain away in the pigeonhole. No, but it's good, it's good attractive material because so many people are actually interested in it. Mm. Not for very deep reasons, you know, there's a lot of people you can go to and you can you say a bit more than the superficial stuff and it's like well I, I'm a bit frightened about that I don't really want to know that much mm. but there's a lot of people just want to know the um, the the basics and the basics are very well shown in the film Ghost and I have to go back to Ghost because it's such a uh, clear and simple depiction of the situation and what happens in Ghost is that uh, Demi Moore's boyfriend, who's played by, is it Patrick Swayze or John yeah. Swayze? Patrick Swayze. Patrick Swayze is, is murdered, and he doesn't realise that he is dead. And so he, he's in a position where he's, he's trapped in what the spiritualists call the earth plane, which is the next dimension virtually parallel to and virtually contiguous with the physical world which we live in. And he's trapped in the earth plane, and what is shown there is the existence of these little nasty black entities that try and attack him and drag him down to their level. And these, these in turn, are known as lower astral entities. So in this, this kind of depiction, the, the astral plane, which is the next plane up, next plane of survival up from the physical plane, is, can be divided normally into seven levels. The lowest two levels are the levels that you might call hell. So this idea they have, for example, in Christianity of hell and burning hell, etc., comes from visions that may, people may have picked up or seen of the lower astral world. But the essence of the lower astral world, and of fact of all these worlds, is as you are and as you have behaved, so you create for yourself. There is no devil pushing you down into hell. If you are an evil person or you've committed murder or you've done, you will create that kind of personal hell for yourself and you will go to it until you can perceive a different mm -hmm. existence for yourself in which case you may be able to yeah, you see, we see that in the Indian subcontinent with this uh, whole idea of karma and karmic debt if you can lead a good life and be positive you'll presumably you know be able to you know go into the nice uh, one of the nicer uh, levels I think, I think the idea of karma is, is more tied up with what happens to you when you reincarnate, how, what, what you reincarnate as, and the experience that you will go through. That's what I think, rather than what, where you are in the interim period. But most people are not going to go to the lowest levels of the astral. Of course, these would be the levels where demons, devils, and all these other nasty... Yeah, which you see in that movie, in, in Ghost. Yeah. But, but also, larger demons than that, much nastier entities than that, will be found on the lower astral. They're just like the little foot soldiers. But the real nasty people, that, for example, people may try and summon up in black magic rituals and so forth, will, in my opinion, most likely to be found on the lower levels of the astral plane. Mm -hmm. Of course, above the astral plane, you have many, many, many other layers, which can be found in, in, in many written depictions going up to, of course, very high levels where we're going to find high angels and uh, other uh, advanced uh, cosmic uh, beings and so forth, Buddhas, enlightened Buddhas and so on. Um, so it seems that the whole, you know, geography and structure uh, and arrangement of the 
the non-physical world is in, in fact rather complicated and rather complex and not a simple matter which is going to uh, be resolved by some basic religious ideas of you've got heaven and you've got hell and that's it. Yeah. Rather more complicated. Yeah, now the, these uh, spiritualist churches, they exist all over Britain. I believe that they're in America. It's, it's more or less an international thing, isn't it? Canada, I think, has got spiritualist churches. Possibly, but I certainly know there are many spiritualist churches in Britain. And the, the essential, the essence of the, the service in the spiritualist church is it looks rather like a conventional sort of Baptist Christian service, except instead of a minister, you have a medium. And so they go through the service and they sing hymns and so forth, and the idea of the singing, apart from anything else, is to create an atmosphere which the spirit can work through to excite and energise the atmosphere of the building and the church. And then what the medium is doing is he's reading... Uh, or getting information from spirit and passing it to members of the congregation to help them or, or whatever is deemed to be required. Um, and that is the basis of what's going on in spiritual churches, spiritualist churches. Mm -hmm. So there may, be, there may be in America as well, in Canada and in Australia. I mean, I'm, I would suspect that there are. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> I've got many friends who've, uh, you know, they visited mediums for a reading or whatever or to ask them questions. And a lot of people record and they have an ordinary audio cassette tape. And you've had the advantage of a lot of people is that you do have a good working knowledge of modern digital recording gear. And you did have one opportunity to actually make a very, very good broadcast quality audio recording of one of these instances where you were actually uh, seeing a medium. Well, back in the 70s, I worked for five years with a, an extremely good trance medium who, and this was virtually every Sunday for five years, in a private circle. This was not money paid, this was no commercial gain, no commercial advantage, purely for the interest of the inquirers. Um, and this man, we, we would sit in the lounge of his house and his wife would be there and maybe several other people and so on. To, to start the, the process, we would go to a deep red light. We turn off the normal lights, go to a deep red light, and the, 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 uh, the gentleman would sit in the chair. The man, I think when we started, he was about 45, something like that. And he would sort of slowly sink into a deep sleep trance-like state. And gradually, uh, certain persons would start to speak. And they often start speaking in some kind of foreign language, which I suspect was Sanskrit. One, one word which was used um, often was pandit, and pandit I know means friend. Yes. But, but there were other words spoken very fast which um, I, I couldn't work out, but I suspect it was Sanskrit. Anyway, and then eventually the, what you would call the gatekeepers or the guardians who, who would look after the whole session on the other side would come through and they'd say, right, we're going to bring through this speaker or this speaker and this one's going and this one's coming. And the... The, the speakers would come through and talk about many subjects, be it uh, the nature of life on Earth, the nature of the afterlife, the nature of life on other planets, the, how to distinguish between false mediumship and real mediumship, and many, many other topics. Um, at that time, we recorded using the veritable audio cassette, which was the technology... It's rubbish quality. Technology du jour, you see? Um, and we made transcripts, written transcripts of this. Um, but the actual tapes are, are, are obviously of not particularly good quality. Uh, I, did, I left this, this circle in about 1980, and we resumed very briefly for a couple of sessions in 1992. Now, of course, technology had moved on enormously, and we had this you know, much superior digital technology. So I was able to, to record, in effect, a couple of broadcast quality sessions of this, and I have them. If, if we are allowed to use any of it, I'll yeah. have to ask the, uh, the spirits. Yeah, the, the, the spirit world if they agree to it being used. Okay. Now, we were just talking outside about um, Swedenborg. I've got a couple of really, really good videos from the Swedenborg Society. They're apparently, again, they've been running for a very, very long time. Uh, is there anything you want to say about the Swedenborgian movement? Or whatever it's I just don't know enough about it, okay. so. I know it was very important in the whole... Yeah. Yeah, it's one of these influential characters.
Lazarus has continued. Yeah, I, I can't, at this point, I can't say too much about it. Um, am I right in saying that Edgar Casey was more or less a medium? Yes, Edgar Casey is, is perhaps arguably one of the most famous mediums that ever existed. And all his work is well documented and is held in a foundation at Virginia Beach in, uh, in Virginia, in the US. Now, as I understand it, Casey was an uneducated farm boy um, who came to notice in the 1930s. I think he was also referred to as the sleeping medium or something like that. And what he would do would, would be to go in a very deep trance and I think people would speak through him or uh, something like that. But what essentially he did was people came with health problems and he would give them advice on how to cure their problems. And there, there are hundreds, perhaps even thousands of cases on record in the foundation of people who came, outlined their health problem, and he would say, right, you must do this, you must take that, you must eat this type of food and so on. And this is absolutely documented stuff. This is not... Uh, and he was... Shamans by a spirit. Well, I, I guess so. There must have been a whole team behind him who, who knew how to not only resolve the problems, but first of all to look into the karmic background mm. of the patient or the inquirer. But um, it, it, it seems clear that Casey himself um, didn't have the knowledge to be able to do it from his own subconscious mind. He, he was, uh, you know, a guy who had left school at a very young age as indeed was the chap who, who I worked with, he'd left school at 14. And although he was an intelligent man, you couldn't say he was, he'd been highly educated. And he was coming out with stuff week after week after week. And if you'd been churning that out with the vocal characteristics and so forth, and syntax that he was using, you'd have been at it all week preparing. There's, it would have been a full-time job, in my opinion. That's interesting, isn't it? You know, to produce an hour, an hour or an hour and a half of material. Yeah. And to just virtually flawlessly deliver it and maybe act out five or six characters over that period of time and give out a mass of complex material, where are you getting it from? You've either got an extremely severe multiple personality disorder or you're some kind of absolute genius or it's, it's, the, a, real deal. it's the real deal. And after, you know, we used to dissect it for hours. Of course, he himself wouldn't know what had happened. Uh. So he'd go out and the, the, the speaking would go on and then he'd sort of come around and say, right, ooh, ooh. and we'd tell him, you know, this was going on and that was going on. Yeah. So I think it was the real deal. Now, uh, in your experience with, um, you know, really what can only be described as the highest level audio technology, you know, in the world, and you've had good many years involved in that kind of world, um, have you ever come across any device or electronic gear that somebody has claimed you would be able to use it to hear messages? This, this, this famous case with Spiricon, this weird electronic voice kind of thing, which I, you know, I don't know very much about, but have you ever come across anyone who's been trying, or maybe with radionics, to create a device where person who does not have these special mediumship gifts could maybe have a machine to communicate? Well, yeah, there's two, there's two areas, one, one of which you certainly know about, which is electronic voice phenomenon, yeah. or EVP. And this appears to have started with a, I think it was a German experimenter called Constantine Raudive, mm -hmm. who was just running ordinary tape recorders, and he started noticing that there were words appearing and there were no microphones connected to the tape recorders. I think this is going back to the 1950s or 60s. Yeah. Uh, and since that time, many people, and to this day, many people experience with audio recording. And they either put a microphone in a quiet room or they run some kind of recording device and they do get snatches of words and so on and so forth. What happened in, in radionics was that two of the pioneers, which is Ruth Drown and... George de la War, both developed radionic cameras which apparently could see into the physical etheric world and take distant photographs of the patient who might have been many, many miles away. And these, uh, there's about 12,000 photographs taken by de la War. So this is not a small amount of material. 
This is, this is a substantial collection. And these are held in America by, um, uh, I think it's the Psychotronic Association. Now, when you say that these cameras can look into the so-called physical, etheric world, is this one of these uh, layers or levels? Yes, that this is. Yeah, this is kind of equivalent to what you would call the Earth plane. It's the immediate next energetic level up. And in esoteric theory, yogic theory, or and radionic theory, we hold that the physical form is immediately energized and informed by what we call the physical etheric body. So this is the immediate layer, which is, as it were, holding, in our opinion, holding your physical body together. And illness, in its most immediate form, is the result of a disturbance to the physical etheric body. It's actually much more complicated than that, but that's where we start. Um, so it seems that what he was photographing, for example, if you had a tumour or whatever he may have photographed, it was a photograph of the energetic equivalent of the physical tumour. And these, uh, I, I heard a, um, a lecture by the, the man who currently has the camera, Dr. Peter Moscow, and he had taken some of the plates to a university in the States. They'd analysed the plates and they'd found out that although they were two-dimensional pictures, they run some process on them that showed they were three-dimensionally encoded. So these are three-dimensional pictures of tumours, and they look like they kind of look like X-rays, black and white X-rays. And um, well, when you see an X-ray, you mean you can sort of see a form on the photograph that correlates directly to the subject that was photographed, or other yes, absolutely. Yeah, I saw some 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 photograph of a I think it was a bowel tumour, and what you see is a kind of very large bright area which is standing out absolutely from the rest of the, the background and there are various other pictures that I've seen one is of a, a child in the womb and so on and so forth but at this point in time because we're now going back I think De La War died about 65, 70, 1960, 70 we're going back to a fairly obscure situation because no one now can get these cameras to work and by the way they don't look like cameras it's just called a camera, but it doesn't look like a digital camera or anything like that. It looks like a rather complex con contraption with spirals in it and all sorts of... Wow. And he took out a patent on this, by the way, which is in, in France. The patent was granted in France. So presumably if you search patent records, you can find yeah. information on this. Now, I'm sure a lot of us have seen these uh, Curlian photographs that have got sort of colours in them. Is the radionic uh, device able to, to show you colours? In those days, the devices they had did not show colours, but I think it would I think it would have been quite a difficult process to develop your own colour plates. But remember, curling photography is a different technique, yeah. and what they do is they have a piece of glass, That's it. they have a piece of film, I think, on top of the glass, and they let loose a very large static discharge of about 30,000 volts underneath the glass, and this seems to energise the aura of the living object on the other side and create this, this static discharge which they can view on the, the plate or the film. Yeah. And also, what you're filming must be present. With radionic photography, what you're filming was not present, could be anywhere in the world. And that's, that's strange. the difference. That's strange. You know, you, you, you don't know. Maybe this, this technology could have been developed so powerfully that it could be used for all kinds of spying. So maybe the spirit world has not let it be developed. We don't know, but imagine if you could have a camera that you could tune in to look into a secret research facility. You see, we've had the remote viewing movement, which, uh, of course, has been really well publicised, but imagine that's only people writing down what they visualise and see through remote viewing. What if you could actually have a device which you could tune into any location on Earth or maybe even on other planets and take photographs of secret installations and so forth? Maybe this has not been allowed by the spirit world. I don't know. Wow. But it seems odd that these cameras existed and suddenly no one can get them to work and they don't... Mm. You know. These kinds of, um, sort of wispy sort of force fields, if you like, that you see in Curlian photographs, are these, in, in your view, you know, sort of showing the so-called physical etheric body, which is very close to the physical body? Whatever it's showing, it certainly seems to have a valid diagnostic 
um, use because they can tell by the integrity of the field which is displayed on the, the plates and so forth, um, the general energetic state and possible illnesses in the person. This is what I understand about Curlian photography. So it seems, to, whatever it's showing, it seems to have some kind of valid yeah. uh, purpose. But the reason I asked that question is because there's this really, really famous Curlian double photographic thing that you see in many books where you've got a leaf and it's got yes. the aura coming from the outside of the leaf. They then chop the leaf in half, photograph it again. You can still see the outline of the leaf before it was cut. Yes, that's, well then, then it's feasible. It's, it's, it's some kind of representation of the physical etheric field. But one, one, one of the things they do is they take a photograph of someone's hand and then they get them to eat a hamburger and they show what happens to the human energy field after you've eaten the hamburger. Or they, they will get uh, a piece of fresh, uh, fresh fruit or fresh food and they can take a series of photos over a couple of hours and they show how the energy field deteriorates. So if you're going to eat fresh food, you need to grow it in your own garden and eat it as you pull it out of the ground to get the maximum energy from it. Wow. All this stuff you're buying in the supermarket that could be months old that's been kept in freezers might taste okay, might taste okay, but energetically it can be absolutely useless. And this can be shown by, for example, uh, Curlian photography, I suppose, or dowsing or whatever. God, that's interesting. You, you've not heard of this? Well, obviously I understand that, you know, if you have the land and everything, then you should be, you know, making good use of it and eating, you know, what you've got complete and utter control over when it's really, really fresh. So you want, you want to talk about to rescues or anything like that? Um, well, you mentioned this thing earlier um, where there was a sort of tragic situation where this little girl died under extreme stress. Okay, well, some, some part of mediumship, which is, which is much, le much less well known than the usual survival of death scenario, is that some mediums specialise in what is rather arduous and emotionally demanding work of rescuing people who have died and don't know that they're dead. So they're trapped in the, the earth plane or the earth continuum and of course this is a timeless or a zone without time so they may have been dead for hundreds of years. And they can appear as ghosts yeah, and they... plenty of photographs of family members standing behind their families long after they've died in family photos. Yeah. Now what the, and in, in a sense you see this in the film Ghost and also in The Sixth Sense where they don't know they've died and a rescue is performed to take them up to the next world but I, I myself have been involved I think in just four of these rescues and in, in, in two of them uh, I remember I was, I was fast asleep and I was kind of woken from sleep uh, right in the middle of the night and told to go up to a chair that I sit in to meditate and so forth. And I'm like saying, well, you know, what do you want of me? What's all this about? And just had to sit in the chair and wait. The next thing you know, I, I was like sort of aware of the presence of this little girl and she'd been burned to death in a fire in a kitchen and she'd sort of been trapped in this layer. And this just went on for a short amount of time and I kind of mentally said to her, don't worry, it's going to be okay. And they just came through and they got her out of there and they took her up to the level that they took her. And these are referred to as rescues? Yeah, these are called rescues. Yeah, this is called rescues. Some people do many rescues. And the other one that was done at that time was then the next day I became aware of some chap who I think had been killed in the First World War. And here we're probably talking sometime in the 1990s when I was doing this. And he was, you know, he was chatting to me like, oh, I don't know where I am. And he was telling me all sorts of things about himself. Um... Mm -hmm you know, in his life and so on. He said, I seem to have been here for a long time and I just can't quite understand it. And, you know, I've still got my uniform on, but, you know, no one's around and it's very odd. And suddenly it was like, right, we're coming in now. And they just, you know, the spirit persons that, that do the rescues on the other side just came in and took him off to, as they say in, in spiritualism, to the light, you know. And uh, so I, I was used in some way. And, and, and to this day, I don't exactly understand why it had to be me and what exactly I did, but for some reason I was a contactable 
a person who maybe could just tune in and just allow them to, to open a, a gate or a door to get through. But this certainly happened. It's not something I've done a lot of, just those and the two others, I think. I don't remember now. Wow. Is there anything you want to add or you want to say? Well, is there anything you need me to add? You well, know, I mean, I mean, you're the other... No, it's absolutely brilliant. Any, anything, any other questions? Really? I mean, you know, uh, uh, Bird gave a pretty good summary as well, so you've got yeah, plenty to go on. There's a lot of correlations, mm. yes. you see, right. between yes. you two. But interestingly, a friend of mine um, used to live with a woman who's, who was a medium and she specialised in rescues, and apparently one time Crowley himself came through. Wow. And, and you'd have to ask him about this in more detail, but apparently he was an absolutely furious contactee and he was he created a, a lot of trouble and was in a complete rage and uh, it was an extremely arduous and difficult situation and what you're saying is that he was trapped well i don't know the whole thing but he came through this woman and for whatever reason and it was apparently it was quite uh, intense and disturbing mm. so you need to ask uh, the, i can put you in touch with the person concerned and you can yeah. get uh, some sort of input on this it seems to me that you know you do get spirits that you could almost grade in terms of their their activity and their strength. And um, I, I don't know whether I mentioned it in one of my talks earlier this week, but I've never ever seen, I've done a lot of reading, I've never ever heard of or you know, ever seen any evidence where you've got a full body apparition, say that people report, where that apparition has any kind of ability to move an object like we associate with poltergeists and what I see is that if you've got a spirit that's a actually able to move an object it's putting all its effort into that and it can't be seen whereas then you get the other side and you get uh, spirits that put all their effort into making themselves visible and yet they're very very weak and there's a classic case with the uh, skull group and spirit came through, and they, they called in, and the spirit just said to them straight away, it's been very hard work to get here, so it's been like walking through custard. And um, have you ever had any visual things, lights, or anything like that? Not really, uh, but I don't consider myself particularly mediumistic. Uh, compared to some that I've met. But occasionally I will get a very strong mental image of, for example, a person or persons who may come into the room. But usually I don't get these. You need to speak to real uh, clairvoyance and clairaudience who can... You know, occasionally I've had words said to me when there was no one in the room. You know, like you're, just, you're sitting in the room doing something and you'll hear Nick in your ear and you go... Well, that's very similar to what we hear with these EVP tapes, because normally what happens, you know, you record an entire tape and you have to sit there and listen to what should be a silent tape, and what happens is that all of a sudden you hear a very short thing and you listen to it over and over again and you realise that that is some voice that's a very long way away and it's usually saying somebody's name. Well, I've had it like right in my ear a few times where they just like, just like someone goes right in your ear and you go like, you turn around and there's just no one there, mm. no one else in the house and you wonder, mm. you know. Well, to wrap up then, um, and we started by saying, you know, there's people that really, are, uh, they're dying in a really pretty bad way because they have all this fear and they're sort of knotted up with the fear of death. Would you say that um, that fear is not necessary whatsoever because, you know, there is this important spiritual element to us that does survive, it well, does it... go on, and uh, really the, you know, the mums and dads tabloid kind of uh, image of death where it's just, just, you just die and that's it. Well, it, it's it, not true. it seems to me, on the balance of probabilities, that we survive what's called death as um, coherent, conscious entities, and we enter a world 
which is as real and substantial to us as is the world we are currently in at the moment and we have our bodies intact. And this appears to be the actual situation. However, because many people do not believe in these things, they go over and they can be either trapped or in a state of confusion. So um, I, my understanding is that there is a large effort in the spirit world of people who specialize in rescuing and, as it were, getting people who die and bringing them upwards into the, the next world properly and getting them settled mm. and um, put into, as it were, comfortable or appropriate because you, not all who go over are good. Yeah. Another aspect, of course, is that just because you go into the next world doesn't mean to say you suddenly become a nice, angelic person with wings on your back. If you're a nasty piece of work in this world, doesn't mean to say your ego or your arrogance or whatever it is is immediately just going to vanish and you're suddenly going to become a nice lovey-dovey person. Mm -hmm. oh, that's, that's you, know, you may leave this world with an awful lot of anger and rage and what else. You, and this is not necessarily immediately just going to evaporate. You'll grow a pair of wings on your back, get a harp and yeah, off you go. Doesn't you know, there's a lot of uh, quite angry people in the spirit world. There's also many, many, it is said, there are many, many people in the spirit world who because of wars and circumstances on this planet are plucked out of this life before they have done what they need to do here and before their time. And this is also regarded as a kind of major problem because wars have killed tens and tens of millions of people, particularly in the last century. And many of these people perhaps couldn't, did not fulfill what they came here to do. And this creates a disturbance perhaps in the fulfillment of destiny and karmic um, objectives. Mm -hmm. So this, this potentially could create difficulties in the, the spirit world because it's all become uneven and unbalanced by these kind of distortions.